Haplotype 0 here with video number 4 from my Super Fight series on the history of boxing. And this video will be on the early pioneers era. Now, my starting point for this stuff is this, the boxing register from the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Uh, and this is the fifth edition. Uh, there might be a newer one out um, since I bought this, but I have some of the older ones and wanted to get about a year ago the newest one in the series. And basically this book uh, details, you know, everything that they document in, in the International Boxing Hall of Fame, starting with the Pioneers era, what they call the Pioneers era, and what I'm going to call the Pioneers era. Um, and um, going on through the old timers, what they call the old timers, and then the modern era. So that's my starting point for what got me interested years ago in this era, which is the era that I find the most interesting um, in, in boxing history, other than what's happening right now at this moment and sort of following the sport as it progresses now. Now, I want to reiterate that um, the origins of boxing are almost certainly from Africa, as I believe and I believe science supports that m everybody on Earth um, originated in Africa, if you go back far enough. And there's this sport called Dambe, which is still practiced there, um, I believe. And obviously there were depictions of boxing in, in ancient Egypt or Kemet um, and wrestling and other sports, but I don't want to get off, off subject because this is a long subject. Um, anyway, uh, so the only reason why I haven't done any super fights on those things, the African origins, is I don't have any accounts of actual super fights or bouts or participants even uh, that that practice boxing back you know before ancient Greece so I started with the Iliad you can go back and read my uh, listen to my Iliad video that one from Homer's Iliad is the earliest depiction of a bout that I could find so we've done the the Greek from the Iliad then we did the Roman you know a Roman depiction from uh, uh, video number three from the Aenid. I still don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but now we're on to the Pioneers era and the Age of Enlightenment. So basically, uh, just to set the stage a little bit, 1600s, the Age of Enlightenment, when uh, after the so called Dark Ages, uh, Western Europe began to harken back to the Greek and Roman um, civilizations and by osmosis Egypt, of course, because Greece and Rome were, were influenced by Egypt and other earlier civilizations. Um, so uh, there was this conscious effort sort of to get back to this classical style of living in society and um, I think that's what brought people back to boxing along with this idea that um, dueling and other blood sports of the day such as bull baiting and bear baiting were sort of becoming uh, unpalatable to the upper classes and you know the novelty had worn off of bear baiting and bull baiting and people didn't want to really see that anymore. Um, they were looking for something more um, humane, which is kind of odd because boxing is quite brutal, especially the way it was pr practiced back then. Um, and also on the other side of things, as a means of, um, uh, as a means of um, deciding disputes or arguments, okay? And uh, my more detailed source on this stuff comes from this essay, which is great, and I'm gonna put a link to it in the description box. It's called The 18th, 18th Century Boxing by Randy Roberts of Lu Louisiana State University. Now, 
he starts in on um, this idea that boxing was a better way to resolve disputes. I'm just going to quickly read a little bit from his thing here. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to read from his thing. Basically, the, the, the gist of it is that, you know, a bloody nose or a black eye was better than, you know, the families of people in disputes having to bury somebody after a duel. And, you know, uh, I'm interested in dueling and, and fencing and stuff. Also, I was a fencer, saber fencer, um, and um, I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. But uh, if you guys want to see examples of uh, dueling as a means to resolve disputes. There's a movie called The Duelists, which has some pretty accurate, although not that accurate, but pretty accurate, uh, you know, depictions of dueling. And also, there's a scene at the end of Rob Roy, the movie with Liam Neeson. Um, but anyway, getting back to the transition from fencing and dueling into boxing, the main, uh, well. Before I get to that, sorry, um, the very first noted or documented uh, boxing match of this era was this boxing match uh, held by Christopher Monk, the second Duke of Albemarle, uh, between his butler and his butcher in 1681. Now, I've heard differing accounts of the exact date, so I'm just going to leave that out, but apparently this guy, Christopher Monk, uh, the Duke of Albemarle was quite an interesting character, and if you're interested in him, you may want to do some research. He was definitely part of this whole idea of the Age of Enlightenment, and he was friends with the king, uh, and held lots of different sporting events. He was a hot-tempered guy. He was known to, you know, in a dispute with even, you know, people of his own ilk would throw a drink in their face or slap people and just a sort of a violent crazy guy and, and I think part of that was facilitated by his friendship with the king they would hold games and do matches and bet on stuff um, he and the king um, from what I've read and I've done a fair amount of research trying to find an account of the match between the butler and the butcher but really all I can ever find is the fact that it happened and that the butcher won so that brings us to the first main character of this era which is a guy named James Fig uh, and I've this is this was really my starting point for this era because this guy I find interested in interesting and I identify with him because he was a fencer and a duelist first and then got into boxing later which is the same thing with me I was a fencer and um, I was quite good at fencing probably better than I was at boxing um, I don't know I, I didn't really pursue it the way I should have but um, anyway that's why I identify with James Fig now he was known uh, as a better fencer and more of a brutal fighter as opposed to graceful but he was effective according to all the stuff that I've read and what I've been able to find he was in about 271 fights and I can only find a record of him losing one with avenging that loss immediately thereafter um, so that's a pretty good record and uh, remember, this is the bare knuckle era with no rules. There are no official rules of boxing at this point in time. Um, so wrestling was allowed, um, gouging, you know, biting. You know, this was the brutal era. But uh, apparently, James Fig, although he wasn't graceful was very very effective and did a major job and was sort of like the the Muhammad Ali for lack of a better term of his era because he was so popular that he really popularized the sport and because of him the noblemen and and the crown of the time recognized boxing and uh, allowed it to flourish um, 
anyway. So um, uh, I think it's interesting to also note that at that time, uh, in James Figg's time, that female boxing was almost, if not as popular as male boxing, and there was this Mrs. Elizabeth Stokes who was uh, the f uh, the f first female champion, okay? Um, but I guess uh, eventually that died out and uh, the male boxing took over, okay? Uh, so basically there were some notable fights of Figs. I may do one of his fights as, as the first super fight, but after him, uh, he he uh he when he retired from boxing after winning um boxing kind of died out again so just from this essay that i mentioned before by randy roberts thus at a crucial period in the ring's history no one could attract the public's imagination and the much needed royal support was withdrawn but again one man would emerge to revive pugilism and bring back the royal patronage okay so basically after um fig he tried to pass on his title to other guys and no one was really captivating to the public so it sort of died out until jack Brock brockton okay so Jack Brockton is the first guy to introduce a set of rules and um, most people would know that the Brockton rules was the first recorded in the, you know, at least in recent history, not ancient history, rules of boxing. I'll probably, I'm not going to read them and bore you to death with those, but I'll put them in the, the, uh, the text um, of the video. Uh, but Brockton was really the first guy to set a rule, the rules, and also the first guy to separate it completely from fencing. So in other words, when Fig had his school of boxing, you'd also learn the quarter staff, you'd learn, you know, the foil and the sword, and all these things were sort of combined into the duels and boxing duels of the time. It wasn't just straight boxing until Brockton... Brockton sort of made boxing um, its singular, you know, pursuit, uh, his singular pursuit. And he's n known for bringing defense, parrying, blocking, um, uh, able to catch punches, uh, punch straight from the shoulder, um, and his favorite punch was called the projectile by uh, ring fans. It was a hard, straight right hand punch to the pit of the stomach, and when it landed, the fight was generally over. I'm reading from the essay that I meant before uh, that I mentioned before, um, but even such a larger than life and great figure such as Brockton. Uh, had his flaws, um, and the rules had their flaws too. And I'll just quickly read this excerpt. Under Brockton's rules, a dying fighter could be brought to the scratch by his seconds and flung at his opponent in the hopes that a miracle or police intervention might somehow save his backer's money before the referee pronounced life extinct and their man beaten. So... That was the reason maybe for, you know, more rules to be written later on. But um, Brockton's career came to an end when he lost. Um, and he was basically, you know, was living the high life and got out of shape uh, and uh, lost the bet. And when he left the sport, again, the sport sort of died out to a large degree. And there were a couple fights under Brockton that I might do as individual fights for the Super Fight series. Um, but the after Brockton, you know, boxing went back to becoming more brutal and corrupt, and you know, not um, not well attended by royal persons, and 
patrons. Back then, you had to have a patron. A patron was sort of like what we know as a promoter now. Like right now, you're a boxer. You want to be with Heyman. You want to be with Aram. You want to be with De La Hoya. You have a rich patron that sort of puts up money for your career and stuff like that. And they had the same thing back then. The only difference is they were called patrons then. Now they're called promoters and advisors and managers and stuff like that or investors even so uh, so Brockton goes out in 1750 uh, Brockton was fat and out of condition lost and from 1750 to 1789 boxing sort of died down a little bit until the rise of uh, this guy Daniel Mendoza Daniel Mendoza was the fighter most directly responsible for pulling boxing out of its doldrums. He was a Jew of Spanish descent from London's East End, and he provided the spark to reignite the public interest in boxing. He was small, light, and uh, he revolutionized the sport when he introduced new fighting techniques during the period uh blah 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 sorry uh nothing really good there so basically this guy must have been pretty pretty amazing he uh he brought boxing back to popularity and the prince of wales gave mendoza an audience which sort of signaled that boxing um had reached uh the upper classes and and the upper classes were socially free to enjoy the sport okay so but not everyone liked him because he was jewish and of spanish descent and at that time you know there wasn't that much love for those people remember that this period directly coincides with the napoleonic wars so nationalism was at, at very high levels at the time so, you know, he went on to get beaten by uh, this Englishman. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because I'll probably do a super fight video on that one. So then after that, you get to the point where Bill Richmond comes onto the scene. This is the first American, um, an ex-slave who was owned by uh, a preacher if I'm not mistaken, which I find crazy, uh, how anyone could call themselves a man of God and, and own a slave. Uh, but I guess, you know, stranger things have happened uh, in history. Um, anyway, he was ended up getting his freedom uh, and getting to England under patronage. I'll go into more detail on him. But he also... Uh, developed his own fighting style and um, you know added to the scientific nature of boxing made it more of a graceful and he was a smaller guy too very interesting character I'm definitely going to do some of his fights as super fights in the series um, and then you have Tom Cribb who was you know a, gr a great British champion who fought Richmond, which will be one of the super fights I do. And then you have uh, Richmond's pupil, Tom Molyneux, who's another ex-slave that made his way to England after fighting in, um, you know, under slavery, um, the terrible practice of boxing that was going on in the United States, which I'm not going to go too much into. I don't particularly find it interesting aside from the fact of knowing about it and uh, and all that but it was very brutal and um, extremely um, inhumane so um, but coming out of that he did so well at it Molyneux that he won his master I guess so much money that he was freed and he ended up going to England and linking up with Bill Richmond and being trained by Bill Richmond uh, and he also took on Crib in two of what were this era's biggest super fights. 
So um, after this video, we'll get more. In, uh, we'll go specifically in on the details of, of those fights. I know I wanted to add a lot more detail into this, but I don't want to bore everyone and make a stupid video. Definitely check out this essay, 18th Century Boxing by Randy Roberts of the Louisiana State University. It took me a long time to find it, and it's probably the best, most detailed uh, source that I can find on this era, which I find very interesting. And of course, Boxing Register has the beginning information, the cursory information. Not all of it's accurate, um, not all of it's you know unbiased, but it's definitely a good starting point if you're interested in the Pioneers era. Um, and I, I used a bunch of other sources, but I'm not going to bore everyone by going through a bunch of sources. So um, that's it. That's the introduction to the early Pioneers era. I may do another introduction to the later Pioneers era. But um, that's it for now. I uh, hope you find that interesting. And now we can get into specific super fights from this era having given uh, this background information.